Well, good morning. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Anthony Warman. For those who don't do know me, my name is still Anthony Warman. Uh, I wanted to carry on a little bit with Josh's comment there. Uh, I did appreciate his, his, him, his and Stephen's song. I wanted to carry that thought on a little bit. For those of us, though, Stephen made this comment that said, there's a lot that you can hide under your mask, and there is. But I found that there's this one benefit to these masks. Do you use the right kind of beard balm? You know, if you use that pine scent, it smells like hunting every single day of the year. Or, or Christmas. Anyways, thank you for joining us, me this morning. Thank you for joining us this morning, whether it's online or here in person. And it's my pleasure to open the Word of God today. Today we're going to look at another in our series of Encountering Jesus. And our passage today, we're going to look in... Oh, it's in this pocket, sorry. We're going to look at Mark 14, verses 1 to 11. But before we do that, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I pray that you would bless us this day. I pray that you would open our hearts to your word, that it would be a living thing to us, Lord God. We pray that you would be glorified in all things as we read and study this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Unfortunately, I forgot to look it up in the Blue Bibles, so it'll be like your own sword drill here to, so, but, so we're going to be reading from uh, Mark 14, verses 1 to 11. Now, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priest and the teacher of the law were scheming to arrest him secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he, that is Jesus, was in Bethany reclining at the table of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor will always, you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, Whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. As with all of the encounter series that we've been looking at, uh, we've been asking some big questions. In Pastor Brent's sermon of a couple of weeks ago, Jesus asked of the two disciples that were approaching him, want. And as I've, I, I've read and, and studied this encounter today, I feel pressed to ask this question. How are you going to respond to Jesus? I'd like us to keep that in our mind as we pick apart some of this text because that's, that's where each part of our encounter is going to be. But I found it helpful for myself in studying this passage to understand a little bit of the context of the story and of Mark. We're primarily looking at this, God, this story through the Gospel of Mark. However, it is also found in both Matthew and Matthew 26 and in John chapter 12. It's likely that both Matthew and John had Mark's gospel in front of them as a, as a foundation and a framework to which they can add detail. So it's with these three gospels as a whole together that we can see a really big picture, the full picture of this encounter. Uh, 
one thing to note, there, there is a, a story, the anointing of Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 7. Uh, this is a different story than the one that we're looking at today, just so to keep that in your mind as well, that this is a different story. And it's easy to confuse them, to think that they're all the same. We don't have time to go into depth, of, into a real in-depth comparison of those. But just so that you can understand there is difference. In Luke, the story takes place in the house of Simon the Pharisee. In ours, as was said, it, it takes place in the house of Simon the leper. The two women are different. One, we will know. We will talk about that later. We know who she is. In our encounter, we know who she is. The woman who anoints Jesus' feet in Luke is, is unknown. And the reasons for anointing Jesus is different. Even if the actions, the actual act of anointing Jesus is the same, so when we study Mark, and when we look at Mark, we need to know that he's focusing us on the cross. Our encounter here in chapter 14 is a turning point. And it's a good place to be here today, a few days after Christmas. Mark chapter 14 is a hinge. If you think of a door, it's a hinge. And what it is, is it's, it's, Mark is turning us from Jesus' public ministry to Jesus' own focus on the cross. So this is Jesus swinging to his passion narrative. And so we should now be looking and starting to swing our focus now towards the cross, to Easter. Mark's main, mainly interested in proclaiming the message that Jesus is the Messiah with that. That is his main message of his book, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. That's why he, he has that passion narrative that he's swinging us towards. So with that, he's not particularly careful with a chronology. Sometimes in our encounter here, it looks like it's out of place. It looks like story are out of time. And they are. If you'd like to see the story from a timeline, you should read John. But what we need to know is that this is intentional and purposeful, and it will help us answer this question. Any in-depth reading that you do of Mark, he has this sandwich, a literary sandwich where he takes two pieces of bread and a piece of meat in the middle, and this is how he frames his story. And he takes that, those pieces of bread and he contrasts them to that middle piece of meat. So... Let's dive into our sandwich. Funny side note is when I typed in Mark's sandwich, um, they gave me a piece of, two pieces of Wonder Bread with some bologna. That, that was the image that came up. You, but it's great bologna, believe me. It's great meat. So our first piece of bread, that nice piece of wonder bread that we've got on the top there, is verses 1 and 2. And this is the response to our question by the chief priests. Jesus is not present in this encounter, but it's a culmination of all previous encounters that Jesus has had with the Pharisees. <clears throat> And we've seen those a number of times throughout this series. And this is also a foreshadowing of Jesus' encounters with the Pharisees going forward now. Matthew 26, verses 3, tells us that this plot that, that we read about, this plot to arrest and kill Jesus, is led by Caiaphas. Well, this is a foreshadowing of Jesus' encounter with Caiaphas. The Pharisees, like I said, are seeking to arrest and kill Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus is both a threat to their authority and to their power and their position. And like I said, this is building, building through, through many of the counters that we've seen. To accomplish their task, they want to do this in secret out of fear of the crowds. Some translations say they want to do this by stealth. Or treacherously. I find it interesting that they are trying to do this treacherously or in secret. 
because the backdrop to this activity is the Passover festival. This is a huge celebration for the Jewish people. And if you'd like to read about that, is in has four, had at the time four million people. It's a very large city. You could feel the world coming to a celebration like that. You could just feel them coming. You could feel, even in a big city, the number of people coming. The other is, how many remember this? Does anybody remember Boonstock? Boonstock was a music festival, for those who don't know, that was in Gibbons for a number of years. Uh, it was a, what, a punk, grunge, rock concert. Um, this news article from uh, 2013 said there was 65,000 people that attended in Gibbons. I remember having the Canada Day Parade in Gibbons, and we suddenly had people from Boonstock traveling along with the paraders, looking for the liquor store. So imagine this, that's the type of thing that the Pharisees are trying to risk a lot. The timeline of this story, the Pharisee part of the story, this came to where there there was a lot to risk to do this openly the f the crowd only feared the crowd of that but they feared the crowd because control of the crowds was fragile. There are numerous groups that at, at Passover trying to overthrow Rome or trying to over And the concept of the Messiah was duration of peace by a conqueror while Jesus has come. Their, fra their control was fragile. So the chief priests going to respond to our question in a way that is about secrecy and hostility. So what is the second piece of bread? This, the second piece of bread is verses 10 11. That's where we see Judas go out to the chief priests to trade Jesus money. Very similar to our first piece of bread, this is not an in-person encounter with Jesus, but it again is a foreshadowing of what future events Jesus will experience and events we will see. We're quickly, we, we tend to quickly pass off this part of the encounter while we say, this Judas. What do you expect? But we only do this with the full knowledge of the past. Our 2020 vision glass looking back. Judas, we have to remember, is one of Jesus' circle. Out with the other disciples, cast out pure spirits. He had the money for his disciples. He was trusted. About me, he would have appeared probably the most this like he did nothing to cause alarm amongst their eleven. Judas's hypocrisy is so disguised that the others 
disciples do not suspect a thing at this time. We see in Matthew 26 that Jesus agreed to betray Jesus for pieces of silver. The Bible helps us put this into perspective. Back to Exodus, this is the value of 30 pieces of silver. The value paid when a slave is accidentally killed by an ox. It little that Jesus held to the and to Judas. And it is an example of how low we can sell out to do our own thing when God isn't doing it for us. I believe that Judas knew who Jesus was. Maybe not as we in the way that woman in our encounter does but the Jesus that he did and the Jesus he had was different he had become illusion that Jesus was not the Messiah he wanted for himself so Judas takes what he can give our big question of, of how are you on to Jesus with self interest and desertion and betrayal. This is both tragic and a warning to us to not follow Judas when we feel that Jesus is not giving us what we want and therefore he is not who we want him to be. So our two pieces of bread those nice pieces of wonder bread, are hostility and desertion. Let's look at the meat. Let's look at the good part. We see the, the meat, the, we see this bit in verses 9, or sorry, verses 3 to 9. And our encounter here switches to, to Bethany. It switches to the house of Simon the leper, and Jesus is present. This part of the encounter, Jesus is here. The other characters, if we look at it in Mark, remain unnamed. But from John's gospel, we are told that Lazarus and Martha are there, and they're present there also with their sister Mary. And Mary is the one who has identified as doing the anointing of Jesus. The disciples are also present, and Judas is identified as president, as present. There are a number, a number of really interesting rabbit trails that we could follow. And this story is so packed full of information, but we just don't have the time to explore them all. So we're going to have to stick to Mary, to the woman, and to her response to our big question. First off, Mary should not have been there. Mary should not have been in that room unless she was serving food. Her presence and her act would have been considered socially unacceptable. But this is the same Mary that we have seen worshiping at Jesus' feet in other parts of the gospel. She intentionally seeks an opportunity to do something that no one else has done or does. Mary wants to show lo her love to Jesus or for Jesus to Jesus. This is an act of love to Jesus purely for who he is. This is one of those few times where we see a person giving to Jesus rather than taking from or Jesus giving of himself to us. The other example that we all recognize very easily is from the Christmas story, and that's the three wise men, where they give to Jesus for who he is as a king. Most commentators agree that Mary knew more ab about Jesus than the disciples, that she understood more about Jesus. I even saw one 
one commentator, that he went so far as to believe, say that he believed that Mary learned and understood more at Jesus' feet than all the disciples did during all of Jesus' public ministry. Does she fully understand or can she fully articulate what she's doing? It doesn't matter. It's, a, it's an act of love. I really like how uh, Charles Spurgeon, who's, who was a Baptist a pastor, how he describes her understanding. He says that Mary's eyes had peered within the veil. I think that as Mary sat at Jesus' feet, she had this whoa moment that she knew who Jesus was and this is her ultimate gift to Jesus for who he is. It's a result of her belief. Her faith is assured and she understands that. Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the Messiah is assured and she understands that. And I think, and many others do, that she truly does understand what Jesus is going to do next. He's telling them he's going to his death on the cross. This is why Jesus tells us that she is also doing this for his burial. In physical terms, Mary anointed Jesus' head in her response. And she did that in, if we look at Mark and in Matthew and in in John, it says that she anointed feet. Well, likely there was enough for both acts. There was nearly a half a liter of perfume. That, that could probably anoint pretty well all of you. The disciples, in their reaction to her love gift in verses 14, verse 5, <clears throat> Tell us that it was expensive, that there was value in this. The value given is 300 denarii. Where's that thing? There you go. There's a denarii. For anyone who'd like, that's a denarii from Jesus' time. And thanks to a quick calculation by the disciples, we know that the value of a denarii <clears throat> is roughly the value of a year's wage for a common laborer. So if you take away the Sabbath and you take away all the festivals, there's about 300 days that they would have worked and they would have received a denarii a day. So it's a year's wages. To put this into perspective, the disciples did us a favor in Mark chapter 6. When Jesus told them to go and get food to feed the 5,000, they did another quick calculation. Judas is probably really good on his math here. That it would cost 200 denarii to feed 5,000 people. So by that math, our 300 denarii would feed approximately 7,500 people. To put that into perspective for us, when we're done, I'd like you to take 7,500 of your closest friends, obviously social distanced, and take them through the Dairy Queen drive through And every one of your friends is going to receive the $7 cheeseburger special complete with drink, fries, and dilly bar. That is going to cost you $52,500. For many people, that's a year's wages. So beyond the physical act that Mary has done in this encounter, beyond that, that physical thing, what is she doing? Well, she's giving Jesus her best. She is giving essentially all of herself all of her past, all of her present, and all of her future in love to Jesus. This perfume was likely a, f a family heirloom. Its value and rarity, the fact that in order to, to get this, we don't need to go into the big context, context of what it is, but likely it had to come from India. The, the effort to get it from India was such that it was probably passed down from generation to generation. This perfume was also her marriage dowry. It was all the worldly value that she could and would bring to a marriage. That is her present. After giving this to Jesus, that potential value possibility goes away for her. Here, It is also something that would have been saved for her own burial. 
for her future. The disciples in their response, led by Judas, but they were all there, see this as a waste. They were indignant. And if you take the Greek word, root word, for the disciples' reaction, it is that idea of the snorting of a horse. So that raspberry sound that a horse makes, this is not subtle. This is open and active scorn to Mary's actions. So Mary's devotion reveals the true heart of those who scorn her at that moment, and particularly Judas. The suggestion is that this gift should be sold and given to the poor. And this idea falls flat when we look at 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And if we think of Mary's action, her response as descriptive rather than prescriptive, what does she model for us? Extravagant love, overflowing worship, adoration for Jesus simply for who he is. Our response should then be done with considerable sacrifice, meaning it carries value. We've seen that. And it should be done with preparation. This is not a surge of emotion on Mary's part. She didn't just carry around a half a liter worth of perfume just in case. She didn't see Jesus in an epiphany of a moment rush him with her perfume. Whip it out of her bag and just, oh yes, I'm going to do it. No. This is intentional and this is purposeful. So we ask our big question, What is our response? I can't give you what that will specifically be for you. It may be a calling to the ministry in a far off place, a dangerous place, or maybe to a socially unacceptable people where those around you consider it a waste and your life a waste and it of little value. It could be something like that, like Mary, that physical action. But what if For a start, it is an intentional, purposeful act to love Jesus more and ourselves less. In the chaos of our world and in the chaos of COVID-19, maybe we should die a little bit more to our own interests and simply act more intentionally to love Jesus simply for who he is, the Son of God. How then will you respond? Will your response be worship? Or will it be desertion? Will it be love? Or will it be hostility? I will leave you with this last thought, from, again from Charles Spurgeon. He says, Come, let us slay sin, for Christ was slain. Come, let us bury all of our pride, for Christ was buried. Come, let us rise to newness of life, for Christ is risen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you have given us this word. We thank you that we have an opportunity to respond to you, Lord God. We thank you that you give us multiple opportunities. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to to love you for who you are as the Son of God. In your name we pray. Amen.